And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 is in. Welcome to Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast. I am Russell Brown, and joining me today, somebody that I've been wanting to have onto the show for a long time, Emery Hunt, owner of Football Game Plan, which you can check out over at footballgameplan.com. He's also a writer for The Athletic Fantasy, and he's also an expert at Sportsline. Emery, my man, how are we? I'm doing fine, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is draft season. This is the, the, the time of the year that we've been uh, waiting for. Uh, the, the final stretch, as I've been saying for the last couple of days, it's, it's April 1st. No April Fool's Days, though, or jokes for me. Um, but, but let's jump into this, and let's jump into you with your uh, start into the business and, and how it all came about for you. Uh, as we were talking back and forth through the DMs, you had told me, you know, you've been grinding for the last 12 years, and here you are, and, and everything's really starting to, to, to take place for you. And I'm, I'm excited to see it because you truly are one of the nicest guys on Twitter. I mean, you do phenomenal stuff. Uh, and again, guys, you have to check it out, footballgameplan.com. It's, it's a tremendous resource, especially on YouTube. Uh, great video content all the time. But let's start. How did you get your start into the, to covering football and, and the draft and everything else? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, man, because, you know, you know, play college ball. Uh, after my time was done and I graduated college, I went back to my old high school in New Orleans and, and coached high school ball. And I only coached for a year in that mm-hmm. spring before I jumped into corporate America. I jumped into you know corporate America as a as a recruiter and so a, a, a recruiter for a technical college. So my my territory is from like Louisiana to Mississippi, and then after Katrina, it pushed me up this way. Wow. Uh, to New York City, New Jersey, and you know I had a choice. It was either up here or Southwest Missouri. I was like, I'm a city dude, so it's no brainer. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I got up here, and my territory was like Jersey, uh, New York City, and New York State, Delaware, and parts of Connecticut. So I was all in Maryland. So I was all over the place, speaking in high schools, talking to students, telling them follow their passion, do what they want to do. But in the back of my mind, I really just wanted to get back in football. Mm-hmm. And I had. Um, some opportunities to to coach uh, in college. I, I was afraid to make that move. I had an interview. I got down to the last uh, the last interview for a head coaching job out here at a high school, and I was like, ah, I didn't want to make the jump, but I knew I wanted to get back in football. And so in 2007, uh, while still doing my thing as a recruiter, I started Football Game Plan as just a website, and we were doing that, and uh, we was probably the only place to predict App State beat Michigan. <laughs> and it kind of put us on the map, and uh, so that made us that made us huge with the small college ranks. And 2009, we started the video content because my degree is in broadcasting. So yeah, we started videos, started doing YouTube videos, which was cool because it it was it, it was quicker for me to get what I wanted to say out verbally as opposed to writing than editing yeah. than finding pictures. Mm-hmm. And then um, 2011, we started doing live podcasts on Saturday mornings. We had 11 to 1 show where people would call in. It was pretty cool. And, you know, 2012, I started doing football game plan full time. And I want to say 2015 was my first color commentary opportunity. I did a women's tackle football playoff game down in D.C. And that spawned everything else. And that's how I got to do college football games and high school games. And that's kind of brought me to where I am today doing college games, uh, you know, every week, sometimes two games in a day or even two games in the same week. So, yeah. That, and man, it's awesome. I'm telling you, it's, it's like seeing people being able to like achieve their dreams. And I've only been following you, you know, for a short period of time, but it's just like, man, like every time I go to the page, there's like a ton of new stuff and it's so much fun. And like during the regular season, like seeing you, covering college games and then going to I, and if I remember correctly there was like a, a picture that you had po- posted of going to maybe the Jets or the Giants game and just kind of scouting the game there and it was like 
this is like, this guy is making all the right moves and it's, it's, it's great to see, man. So again, really appreciate you taking the time and I appreciate uh, you following me back and, and, and reaching back out to me to, to be on the show. So uh, let's jump into this, this draft stuff and let's start at the very top. We all know um, that Kyler Murray has been the talk of the town. I mean, that's been the, the thing um, really for the last two, three months and it kind of gets repetitive. It's, I'm sure as you know, you know, being on the radio and things like that, it's something that's constantly brought up, but it's something that I feel like we need to talk about because we've gone away from it a little bit on a, on a day-to-day basis on the podcast here. Um, but Kyler Murray going first overall seems to be the lock, but maybe not because it seems like two or three beat writers for the Cardinals are saying, hold the phone. We could very well see uh, a change at that first pick with maybe Nick Bosa. Um, what are your thoughts on, on what the Cardinals will do with the first pick? And do you think it will be Kyler Murray? You know, it's interesting because I, I have the same mindset for Josh Rosen that I had about Deshaun Kaiser. I felt as though Cleveland shouldn't have moved on from him right away. You know, mm-hmm. you want to see a young guy that struggled come back and find his groove because he has talent. And I feel the same way about Josh Rosen. I wouldn't give up on him after one year, no matter who's at the top of the board. And if you do, wouldn't it kind of sign the death certificate for Steve Kime? Like, man, you just traded up and drafted this dude in the top 10, and now you're drafting another quarterback first overall. And so I would, I can see why they would probably go with the position player as opposed to going with a quarterback. So I could definitely see that scenario playing out, but the smoke is just so strong from all the different insiders and media outlets saying that it's going to be Kyler Murray, but, you know, we won't know until April 25th. And, <laughs> you know, so I, I, until then, everything is still on the table because if you look at it, okay, Josh Rosen struggled, but we've seen this story before. Alex Smith had one touchdown, 11 picks in his rookie season. We talked about Deshaun Kaiser struggling, uh, 11 touchdowns, 22 picks. Jared Goff had the worst rookie season probably in history statistically outside of Josh Rosen uh, when you break down the split. So we've seen this story before. Matt Stafford struggled and was also injured. Mm -hmm. So we've seen guys kind of bounce back. So I would, be maybe me i would probably be a little bit more cautious at, as re, you know to replacing a guy right away as opposed to continuing to build the team around him and giving him a better team and again if if this is the year two and he struggles once again okay then the following year we go get the quarterback because now the team is a lot better for a better guy to step in and take over yeah and i'm in the same boat as you i think you know it would be asinine to to trade away Josh Rosen, who is, by the way, and I think a lot of people forget this, he's only 22 years of age. Like Kyler Murray in May or June, he'll be 22 years of age. Drew Locke is 23. I mean, a lot of these quarterbacks are exactly the same age um, or around the same age as Josh Rosen. And I get it. Of course, that makes sense. You know, they're one year apart, but that's the point. Like, it's been one year. He's only 22. Build around him and, and grow let him grow I mean Larry Fitzgerald was dinged up last year Christian Kirk who started building really good rapport with Josh Rosen and they started producing on the field he had gotten hurt so I mean like and that offensive line is just atrocious and and maybe this is again it could be a smoke screen it seems like with with so much smoke there's definitely some type of fire around it but it certainly seems like you know, there, there could be a, a way for them to maybe try to trade back. And this is a way to build up interest for Kyler Murray for a team like maybe the Giants or the Raiders that really want him. The Raiders had worked out with him quite a bit um, with a private workout today. And it sounds like they were supposed to have some type of meeting afterwards. John Gruden was holding up Kyler Murray. Um, but with Kyler Murray, what are your thoughts on him as a prospect? I like Murray. Um, to me, I compare this game to Russell Wilson coming out of NC State. Now, I, I use that as a preference because a preference because you look at Russell Wilson out of NC State, played a lot like Kyle Murray, a guy that did a lot of stuff that people like to say off script, you know, uses athleticism to buy time, mm-hmm. was making a lot of big plays outside the framework of the play and, and finding guys deep down the field. Only when he went to Wisconsin was he, well, was he able to smooth out his game and uh, be a little bit more polished player. And that's why we saw him have his best season at Wisconsin as opposed to what he did three years prior at NC State. So I see a little bit of that coming from Kyler Murray, except he's going to get his polish, you know, in the NFL as opposed to getting it at another school for Mm -hmm. one more season. So I I like him. I think he doesn't have the accuracy of, uh, let's say, a Baker Mayfield had last year, you know, but he has a stronger arm. 
He's definitely more athletic, so he he makes it at an 11 on 11 game. So there's a lot to like. I could see why someone would have them as their QB one. Um, you know, I, I just think that it all, it all depends on where he goes. And I think, you know, where he goes is going to determine whether or not he's going to have success. The talent is there, but you want someone to fully buy into his skill set and allow him to be him and not try to make him something else. Right. Well, and do you feel like there's a specific fit that would be beneficial for Kyler Murray? Like, would it be Oakland with the weapons that they have? Or, or do you think it would be somewhere like the Giants where he could sit behind somebody like an Eli for a year? I have a hard time believing John Gruden wants a rookie quarterback. We haven't seen him display that uh, patience in, in his entire coaching career. It seems mm-hmm. like he has always wanted veterans. And anytime he got a young quarterback, he ran them off pretty quickly. So I don't, I don't think the rookie way is going to be what the Raiders do. But if I had my choice, I would love to see Kyler Murray play with the Washington Redskins. I think that's a perfect fit for him. Jay Jay Gruden's offense, I think, does a great job in pushing the ball at the intermediate level, and I think that's where Kyler Murray thrives. And you also look at the weapons that he'll have at his disposal, outstanding run game, uh, a stable of backs, Darius guys coming back from from injury. Um, You can use the rest of your draft to to really stack up uh, at the tight end position. The offensive line, I think, is solid. Um, Their defense is going to be outstanding this season as well. So I, I think Washington would be the most ideal situation, but obviously he's not, I don't think he'll fall that far, but if I had to pick and choose a place for him to be and thrive immediately, uh, no questions asked, it'll be Washington. I I can't really disagree. I think uh, that would be a really good fit. I think uh, a lot of us here in the media are are picking the wrong Gruden to to, to pair with Kyler Murray. So we will see obviously what happens in, in a couple of weeks, but Hypothetically speaking, Kyler Murray goes first overall. That would clearly mean that Josh Rosen would probably be traded more often than not, uh, as we saw with Deshaun Kaiser get dealt. We saw Brett Favre get dealt after one year with Josh Rosen. If he got dealt, what do you think it would take to to trade for him? And and do you have a potential fit that you like for where he would end up? I I would probably say it'll take a third round pick. Um, I always use this as my, my trade barometer. We saw Marshall Falk at the height of his talent get traded for a second round pick. So everything else is below that for me. If you're, if you're Marshall Falk and you only yield a second round pick, then anybody that's not as good as Marshall Falk is getting <laughs> way less than that. So I would say probably a third round pick. Um, and if I had to pick a spot, I would say Denver would be a good spot for him. Oh. Um, I would also say maybe a team like Miami would be a nice spot. Um, New England would be an ideal spot. Uh, I think those are places where I feel as though Josh Rosen could, could really maximize his ability. Yeah, I agree. I, I think if he ends up in new England, I, I mean, that's just, it's not even fair at this point if that happens, but like, it, it just, it's for, for the Rosen thing. It's just like, he, I feel like he could go anywhere and it would be okay because he, he's going to, I think he's going to be a fine quarterback. I really do. He was my top quarterback last year. I don't see, why a team like like the Cardinals would give up on him. But again, we will see. Let's move to other quarterbacks in this draft because we know Kyler Murray's not the only one. Uh, let's start with your top quarterback, Dwayne Haskins. Um, what are your thoughts on him as a quarterback? I love Dwayne Haskins. He would have been my number one quarterback in last year's class. And last year I had uh, Lamar Jackson as my QB1. And I, and I raved about Jackson and his ability to make it an 11-on-11 game. But Haskins just has that it about him. You know, when you mm-hmm. watch him throw, and you don't even have to it, – it just isn't at, in a passing you – know, as a passing view, right? You're watching him play. The level of confidence that he throws, where you just automatically assume, okay, this is going to be a completion. That's yeah. a completion. This is a completion. Just by how he throws and, and the decisiveness in which he throws the ball. And when you talk about his accuracy, I mean – you never saw Ohio State receivers have to stop in their tracks to come back to catch a ball. Mm-hmm. Everything was hitting them in stride, whether it was short, intermediate, or deep down the field. And, and to display that level of accuracy is is impressive. And also, when you look at the, the history of the Big Ten, you know, this is not known as a passing conference. Um, Drew Brees had the touchdown passing record, and he last played in 99. And you look at a guy that had as great of a season as Dwayne Haskins had this past year, and you have to go back to Russell Wilson. 33 right. touchdowns, four intercepts. 
Haskins, 50 touchdowns, eight intercepts, 70-something completion percentage, um, almost 10 yards of completion. And the fact that he played his best in the biggest of games, it's just mind-blowing that this guy is not being talked about as the clear-cut number one prospect in the class. So I, I'm a big fan of Haskins. I think wherever he goes within three years, that team is going to be in the in the Super Bowl. You know, if he once he starts, wow. I just think that this dude is has the the it about him, and I think he's going to probably be beneficial. Uh, is going to be beneficial for him if he continues to fall down the draft boards to go to somebody that has talent. And um, he's really going to thrive. I think he's a special talent. Yeah, I like Dwayne Haskins a lot. He's my top ranked quarterback. I, you know. I feel like he's just lost in the shuffle. Um, and with the other quarterbacks that are in the shuffle, I mean, how many quarterbacks do you think go uh, in the top 10 of this draft? I, I think I would say probably maybe three at the I, most. Yeah, I agree. I, I just, I think it's like, you know, Kyler Murray's in there. Dwayne Haskins would probably have to be in there and maybe, maybe Drew Locke or Daniel Jones. It's a toss up. It seems like for those guys. If Daniel Jones goes in the top ten, that'll be that'll be almost as surprising as a team trading up one spot in the 2017 draft to take Mitch Trubisky in the draft <laughs> to add Sean Watson and Patrick Mahomes. I would be shocked if that happened. I, hey, you know, crazier thing like it happened in that draft. It could happen here. It's this is why I think we love the draft so much. And uh, just going back to your Dwayne Haskins points, I, two things you said that I love is decisiveness and accuracy. I think those are two things that get way overlooked with him. And a, a, a team that I love for him would be, I, I'm sleeping on it. I, I think a team that will potentially target him and it's not being talked about. It's a silent team right now, but I think it could be deadly. It's, it's the Cincinnati Bengals. I, I just, the, they, they got the, the, the new coaching staff in there. They could be looking to go in another direction away from Andy Dalton. They have not committed to him beyond this year. They have, obviously, they're going to let him play it out, see if he can earn a contract. I know they like him, and he's done great things for the community there, but it is time for a fresh start there, and I, I think Dwayne Haskins would be perfect at 11 if he's there. So I guess we'll see what happens. But moving away from quarterbacks, trading back is very common in the, or in, in the NFL draft. Um, have you heard or have any prediction predictions at all on what teams could do for, for trading back in the first round? Like could the lions potentially trade out of eight? Uh, could the giants take 17 and trade up and move up into the draft? I mean, that's something that you mentioned on Twitter about an hour ago. Um, so, so what are some trade scenarios that you're hearing? I'm not, I'm not hearing any trade scenarios, but the one I just put out about an hour ago, like you mentioned was one that was interesting to me. Everyone talks about, you know, when, the, when they made the trade for Odell Beckham to take 17 to six, move up to three, get the quarterback, right? And mm -hmm. then you heard, okay, well, they'll stay at six and stay at 17 and take two players. But no one ever brought up the scenario of possibly taking 17, maybe their second round pick, which is 37, I believe, and moving up to a team that's probably trying to get out of the top 10 that can still get their guy, but don't want to take him at, that, at the initial spot. So maybe a team that's picking seven, eight, nine, 10, or 11, I would say. So if they can perhaps inch up closer, maybe they have a chance to maximize those two first round picks to get two premier players, get their quarterback and their premier defensive player that they want to get. Um, I would also look at a team that has, you always want to look at teams that have multiple draft picks. When I did my seven round team by team mock draft drafts, it was tough for me to put talent on teams that, you know, some teams are really stacked with talent on, on both ends. And I'm like, man, it's, it'll be tough to put uh, players here. They have 12 picks. So I always look at teams that have more than seven picks, especially mm -hmm. those, those picks within the between rounds three and five, because those are to be the ones that'll that'll package them up to move move up higher, like a New England, like a New York Giants. You know, teams that have those those large picks are you know what I would look at and say like, okay, those are the teams that that perhaps will move up. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's a great scenario with the, with the Giants to to move up in this draft potentially uh, from seventeen and and package something. I, it, like it would not surprise me at all. And you know, as a as a Lions fan myself, I, like I would love to see them trade out of eight, get to seventeen. If they were to acquire thirty six or thirty seven, whatever that pick is in the seventh or second round, if they were able to get that and just allow 
the Giants to move up, get their quarterback, however they want to go about their business. Like, I'd be okay with it because I know at 17, there's still going to be talent there. Like, maybe Brian Burns is there. If not, okay, maybe you settle for Cleveland Farrell. If you're looking at edge rusher, if you're looking for, you know, an offensive lineman, maybe you settle for Cody Ford to play right guard. So I think there's a lot of different things that could happen. And I think there's going to be a lot of teams that would be interested um, in trading back like the Buffalo Bills, like the Jacksonville Jaguars, and again, the Lions. So it will be interesting to see what trades happen. Um, but what about surprise picks? I mean, there's always that one surprise pick that happens in the first round. Sometimes there's three or four. Do you, do you have an idea of what maybe the biggest surprise pick could be or prediction for the first round? It's, it's always interesting to see which position gets, you know, the run on, right? And so mm-hmm. – a few years, it, it, you know, maybe quarterback. You may see five quarterbacks go, right? Yeah. Uh, one year, maybe receiver. Um, this year, I, you feel as though it's going to be defensive line. But after that, I think the surprise would probably end up being corner. Um, mm. When you look at corner, uh, you look at – you talk about Greedy Williams. You talk about, you know, Byron Murphy. Um, you know, but you may see Lonnie Johnson get pushed up, you, which I think is not a bad thing because I, I think highly of his game. I have a, a first-round grade on him, but you may see a cool. Lonnie Johnson. You may see Rocky Sin get in the first round because if it depends on where those corners go, those top two corners go, then everyone may feel as, okay, here's the run. The run is about to start, and you start seeing people select corners as opposed to staying true to what they want to do. Um because once the run starts, if they start picking quarterbacks, I mean, um, cornerbacks high, then you'll start to see a lot more cornerbacks start to come off the board in the first round. I, I like the, the corners that you listed. Three of them, is, well, really all four of them. Rocky Sin is, is a guy that I, I love his aggressiveness. I, I think he's a nasty dude. Lonnie Johnson, I love the length. I, I like his ability to close. And then, you know, Byron Murphy, Greedy Williams, I have no issues there. One guy you didn't name, DeAndre Baker. Why is that? I have a couple of guys ahead of Baker. Baker is, is okay to me. He's a solid corner, but the other guy is great out higher uh, because of the athleticism. Okay. Um, but I do like Baker's ball skills. And if if you follow football game playing, you know I'm big on guys that can score touchdowns. And can you score? Can you take the ball away? That's my philosophy. And guys that get their hands on a lot of passes, I want on my team. And Baker is definitely one that I would want on my squad. Gotcha, gotcha. I just didn't know if it was like something off the field. I had heard that there was, you know, some things with him. People are kind of questioning character and things like that. I, I like do, with with your grading scale. Do you do that at all? Do you put that character stuff in there at all, or, or do you not really focus on that because sometimes we don't get the full scope of everything? I could only focus on what I could justify, and that to me is the film. Gotcha. I, I love it. I love it, brother. Uh, well, let's two more questions, and I'll get you in and out. Uh, two or three of your favorite sleepers for this draft. Favorite sleepers. Um, you know, I, I, I am a big fan, just building off the, you know, what I just talked about, can you score, can you take the ball away? Clifton Duck out of Appalachian, Appalachian State is phenomenal. Um, obviously, I'm a Sun Belt guy. Uh, mm-hmm. Played at the University of Louisiana. And so I'll, I'll watch a lot of Sun Belt football just, you know, as a, as a fan and an alum. Yeah. And look at Clifton Duck. Once he stepped foot on campus, this guy was the best defensive back in the conference. Uh, two-time All-American, a three-time All-Conference player, started all 39 games he was able to play, um, early entry in the draft, and all he does is just take the ball away. He also does a great job of of returning the football, whether that's intercept returns for touchdowns or kickoff and punt returns. He's one of the best returners in the class. So I like Clifton Duck. I think he's going to be an outstanding slot corner. I, th- I saw one comparison for him that that actually made a lot of sense. It was for the uh, late Darren Williams, and I kind of agree with yeah. that. You know, he was a first-round pick. Um, so I like Clifton Duck. I think Duck is a, is a phenomenal talent. Um, another sleeper, I hate giving sleepers from big schools, but no one is talking about Isaiah Bugs. And every time you look up Isaiah Bugs, that, that ugly number 49 is making a play in the backfield. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, it's, you can't get away from it. You, you, you watch Quentin Williams, and he does his thing. But Bugs has the dog that you like to see from a defensive player. He can play anywhere across the defensive front. You even can see him, envision him as one of those power stand-up edge rushers like a Jannard Avery or someone like that. Mm-hmm. I think Isaiah Bugs is being slept on despite him coming from a, a big-time program that everybody watches. 
Right. Well, and it's funny too, because like at the, uh, at the senior bowl, like he was all right there and he, he did some things and like, it's just like, it's odd to me that people overlook him. I think a lot of it was just like the size issue. I think people were a little bit of afraid of like, where is he going to, to match up? But I mean, he checked in at six three three oh six. He put up twenty reps in the bench. Um, a little stiff though with the three cone drill with the eight seconds. But again, he's he's making plays. So like, you can't it, like you mentioned. Like if you're making plays, you're gonna earn a, a, a relatively good grade. So um, I, I like Isaiah Bugs. I I don't know if I would draft them in you know the first three rounds, but if I'm maybe the third round. But if I'm in that fourth round, absolutely. Um, who, and the last question I got for you, who's the one prospect, um, and it, it doesn't have to be like super scheme reliant, but is there one player that you feel if he got to a specific scheme, he would just absolutely thrive at the next level? Colin Saunders out of Western Illinois going to Dallas would be the best fit because I'm a big fan of Rob Marinelli and how he's able to, to, to maximize defensive tackles. I was high on uh, the kid they drafted out of Nebraska. Uh, that's there now. Um, Malik Collins. Yeah, everybody was low on Collins. I actually liked this film. I gave him a high grade. And I, and I said in my report that if he lands with the right D-line coach, they'll unlock him. Because the one thing he you saw on film from him was ball get off. You can't coach that. So he was getting in yeah. the backfield, but he couldn't find the ball. He was just playing. He was over aggressive and was playing out of control. He got with Rob Marinelli, and now this guy is a stud. You know, and I see the same thing. With Saunders, although Saunders is a much more polished player uh, than Collins was coming out of Nebraska, he has the explosiveness, the burst, and if he's able to get in Dallas, get you know, get to the Cowboys with Marinelli and the way he coaches defensive tackles, he may be the most dominant defensive lineman in the NFC uh, outside of Aaron Donald because of how explosive he is, how talented he is, and how great of a coach Rob Marinelli is with the, with that position. Yeah, I love his versatility. I think he could plug in, in a lot of different fronts, whether it's a, as a nose tackle, as it's, whether it's a one technique. Um, I, I'm a big fan of him as well. I'm so glad you, you listed him because we haven't gone into the deep dives yet, which we will over the next two, three weeks here on the podcast. Uh, but he's certainly a guy that I want to get more into. Uh, you know, he had five, uh, five second 40, 27 reps on the bench. So like he, he fits um, a lot of different teams, and I agree. I think Dallas would be an ideal fit. Another player I like for Dallas would be Draymond Jones out of Ohio State. Um, one player I got, though, for a specific scheme, and then we'll get you out, Garrett Bradbury, if he was able – and they don't do it. They don't draft offensive linemen because for some reason they don't like Aaron Rodgers staying healthy. But Garrett Bradbury to the Packers I think would be – it wouldn't be fair um, for one, but like just the amount of reach blocking that they did last year, I can only imagine that they're going to do the same – um, with the new head coach and them probably still going to be sticking with the zone scheme. Um, but with, with Garrett Bradbury, I think it would be phenomenal. I, I love him as a zone blocker. I love the way he reach blocks. I think he'd be phenomenal for the Packers. Um, so that's, that's all I have uh, for, for that. So, but Emery, thank you so much, my man, for, for taking this time and, and speaking with us. Where can we find you on Twitter? People can find me on Twitter at FBall Game Plan and always make sure to Subscribe to the Football Game Plan Network located at youtube.com slash football game plan. You guys, you have to follow him on Twitter. Smash that follow button. Subscribe on YouTube. Check out all the content. Trust me, it is well worth it. So, Emery, thank you again, my man, for taking the time. Uh, For everybody else, this is Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast.